it's now my great pleasure to give the floor to the registrar, John Hawking, to introduce the first panel. Thank you very much, Carsten. Happy birthday, is that correct? <laughs> um, excellencies, judges, colleagues, friends, good morning and welcome to the ICTY Legacy Symposium here in The Hague. After World War II, outbreaks of conflict were like explosions in a minefield. But international criminal justice was a, a barren landscape and then came the ICTY. Within two decades, one court after another turned barren landscape into a village. Today we have a permanent international criminal court, national courts, policy makers, activists, and all of us demanding justice for genocide and war crimes. And it takes a village to make justice possible. This symposium is designed as a sort of roadmap for this village. So it's fitting to start from its first building, the ICTY, and how it was built from the ground up. In 1993, the first 11 judges of the ICTY found themselves facing challenges that their colleagues back home wouldn't have faced. With no rules and little precedent, how could they conduct a trial? the rules of procedure and evidence became item number one on their agenda. Some months later, Prosecutor Goldstone arrived and he too faced his share of dilemmas. How can a court with no, no police force arrest its accused? How do you collect evidence in the middle of a war? The words Nelson Mandela told him when he took up the job resonated. You're a clever chap, you'll learn it all very quickly. In April 1995, the first accused, Dusko Tadic, arrived at the tribunal. It took some courageous lawyers with an unshakable faith in justice to come and defend an accused war criminal amidst unknown judicial procedures and not even knowing how they would get paid. One of Mr. Tadic's de defense counsel is here today, Judge Alfonso Hoy. With the trials came more challenges. How could we give a voice to the witnesses in a way that would minimize their suffering when the wounds of the war were still so fresh? How could we ensure that court sittings in The Hague in a foreign language and in a foreign legal system made sense to the people of the Balkans and to the rest of the world? We were still figuring, figuring all this out when I myself arrived at the court almost 21 years ago, back in early 1997. On the first day of the ICTY's second trial, the Celebici trial, and back then I sat down in front of Judge Odio Benito. It gives me great pleasure to be sitting next to her today. Um, but it was immediately clear to me that this was no ordinary court. We were dealing with, hun with hundreds of thousands of displaced, raped, murdered persons. The images we had seen on TV were materializing before our eyes and those of the world and for the first time in a courtroom. It almost seems impossible that just a few years later I would see from the window of my office, like clockwork, the vans of the Dutch transport police as they came in and out every day with 28 accused on a daily basis appearing in our trials, a record in international criminal justice. With no instruction manual, we went on to create the building blocks that ensured the success of the ICTY, the landmark rulings, the cooperation with member states, and the less known but instrumental practical aspects that built the ICTY. And this building helped build the village. No later international court has ever truly had to build from scratch again. And even as we close, the ICTY will continue to be a model to build on for many years to come. Our panelists today have helped to build this building and to build this village, blazing a trail not only at the ICTY, but at other courts and tribunals as well. And as a moderator, I think I have a really easy job with such an extraordinary panel. 
Judge Elizabeth Odio Benito, one of the first 11 judges of the ICTY, the tribunal's first vice president, the first in a proud line of female leaders at the ICTY, uh, which included a female president, two prosecutors and a registrar. She went on to become a judge at the International Criminal Court on the bench of the ICC's first trial in the case of Thomas Lubanga, and she's now bringing her experience and knowledge to the human rights system in the Americas as a judge at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. On my left at the end, Mark Harmon. Uh, it's great to see you again, Mark. After s Mark, for 17 years, prosecuted uh, some of the ICTY's most high-profile cases. And if you come and watch the, the documentary um, at lunchtime today, you will see um, Mark there as he um, appeared in the, the landmark Kerstich case, which led to the first conviction for genocide at the ICTY. After leaving the ICTY, Mark went on to become the international co-investigating judge at the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia. My immediate left, Colleen Rowan, is here to talk about the defence. And first I want to congratulate Colleen. She's just been appointed, elected, as the new president of the Association of Defence Council practising before the international courts and tribunals. Um, what was the ADC was, um, I think, a very, very important innovation at the I ICTY. It's a very important institution, and it's a great honour that uh, Colleen has been elected to that position. Actually, when I, Colleen and I were at a conference in Nuremberg earlier this year, and she told me that, um, I hope you don't mind me saying this, uh, <laughs> that um, she thought the ICTY was the jewel in the crown of international criminal defence, but... Um, We'll hear what you have to say later. Colleen has also defended clients before the ULEX courts in Kosovo and represented witnesses before the, uh, before the International Criminal Court. And finally, but of course not least, uh, Martin Petrov. Martin had the great misfortune um, to move from being the head of the Office of Legal Aid and Defence to become my um, chief of office for many years. But in that position, among his many achievements, Martin was instrumental in a very difficult challenge of finding enforcement states for our um, convicted persons, and it was a challenge that Martin mastered. After leaving the ICTY, he advised on the reform of the registry at the International Criminal Court and has consulted on registry issues at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon and the Kosovo, Kosovo Specialist Chambers. Thank you to all, my, all the panels. I give the floor to Judge Odio Benito as the first panel member. Thank you very much indeed, my dear John. John, John, as I used to call him. Uh, well, you have John. I was <laughs> a judge in the ICTY, in the ICC, and now in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. That means that as Judge Gabby McDonald said to me, once judge, forever judge. Well, more or less is, is uh, what I want to share with you, some of these experiences. Uh, they are very dear friends, very dear colleagues, excellencies. Thank you for being here this morning to share with us certain memories, which I think are very important. Uh, as we all know, in 19, in the, at the beginning of the 90s, uh, of the last century, former Yugoslavia was uh, being devastated by a horrible war. A horrible war where atrocious crimes were committed, where ethnic cleansing was again in Europe a common word where it, the atrocious crime, crimes committed against women, when the, this sexual violence against women were a no, everyday notice in the international media. Violence against women of all sides of the conflict that was used an instrument of ethnic cleansing for the first time and terror. The Euro European efforts 
to stop the war were futile. So the Security Council, acting under the great pressure of the international community, decided to adopt a, a very original decision to create a judicial organ for the first time after the Nuremberg Tribunal. Because there, there was also a common idea that the peace and international security were in danger. So acting under Chapter 7, the Security Council adopted this decision. Not everybody was happy. Actually, for many members of the international community, that was a sort of, I don't know how to say this in English, but in Spanish it's a plato de babas, a sort of washy-washy, a paper tiger. We were called a paper tiger. Anyway, 11 judges, seven men and two women, Judge McDonald from the United States and myself, were elected, and we came to the, the Hague in a very cold November, like this one. That was my first time in, in Holland. And I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to do here? <laughs> Leaving my tropic to this. But, but, we were really excited. And we, we were elected in September. We came in November, and we were sworn in, and immediately we set out to work. We started drafting the rules of procedure and evidence because we didn't have any. Even we, we didn't have drops. The ICJ judges, with great reluctance because they are very complicated people, the ICJ judges, loan their drops to us. So if you see the first picture of the ICJ in the Peace Palace, in the, this monumental staircase, we are wearing the ICJ robes. We had to immediately <laughs> live there, so we had to also uh, manage. Nino Cassese, who was, you know them, you knew them, uh, uh, his, his activity, he was very, very active, so he really made a lot of things. We got a, a building, uh, we got a secretary, and uh, we didn't have prosecutors. Mark has to remember this. What we had was a great, great commitment. And very soon, we drafted the rules of procedure and evidence of course, completely Anglo-Saxon rules, procedure, and evidence. But Judge McDonald and I were also in the mood to introduce whatever we could to put the sexual violence against women in the first row. So we uh, drafted a rule, a very special rule, 96 rule. Uh, because, because until then, the consent of the rape woman was used as a, a defense. And we said, no way. Rape don't, doesn't admit consent in these circumstances or armed conflict. So the Rule 96 was drafted. Nobody was happy. So, very soon we had to introduce certain uh, elements there. But it was the first show, the first sample, that we were in the mood to talk about rapes, about violence, every kind of violence against women in that war and in all war. So, during the ICTY's first years, and continuing up today, in which the tribunal is closing its mandate, case by case, 
sentence by sentence, the ad hoc criminal justice was a groundbreaking corpus juris. The newly born international criminal law added its contribution to classic international public law and opened new perspectives to international humanitarian law and international human rights law. First case was Tadic. When I hear this small fish, please, please, give me a break. No small fishes in this war. No small fish. All of them were big fish. All of them were very important cases. That was the first time 11 international judges trying to be impartial, objective, fair, were facing these cases. Tadish was a very, very crucial turning point. My dear colleague here presented the pre-motion to say that the ICTY was, a, what was the, the, the exact word in, uh, illegal, illegal, because the Security Council wasn't uh, competent to create a judicial organ. The judicial international organ only could be created by the treaty. But the appeal chamber of the ICTY, which was the same in, for the ICTR, said no. The Security Council has the authority to create these two ad hoc tribunals. So the ad hoc uh, uh, criminal uh, tribunal for former, former Yugoslavia continued. And the first sentence was delivered and it was a dissenting from Judge McDonald because for Judge Stephen and Judge Lalvora, the conflict was a national, interna not international, but national armed conflict. George McDonald said, no, it's an international armed conflict, taking into consideration all the elements uh, um, playing a role in that war. And the appeal chamber gave the reason to her. And since then, the international armed conflict was the atmosphere for the sentences we uh, continue delivering. That was a real turning point. Crimes against humanity, uh, breaches of the Geneva Conventions, violation of the laws and custom of war. And then we had the second trial. The second trial was a very special one as well. It was the Celevici. Because for the first time after Nuremberg that uh, four accused were uh, submitted to trial. We heard 20, 122 witnesses, and we examined 691 exhibits. And the rights of the accused, as in Celevici, were carefully drafted. And in this Celebici sentence, delivered in November 1998, rape was typified as a war crime under torture convention for the first time. For the first time, sexual violence against women were examined and typified as war crimes. Crimes committed against them because they, we are women. And there was another very important highlight in Chilevici, the command responsibility, not only for the military, but also for the civilians. And uh, I have to say again, John, thank you for helping us <laughs> to draft it that very difficult sentence. It was very difficult because we all, the judges, 
uh, writing down different English. So it was John, John magnificent task to put all that in one English. A very good one, Australian, but very good one. So, and it was a very, very important first uh, case for, the, for women. Afterwards, we had uh, um, the, the, the Purunja cases. In these in this first years, we had excellent prosecutors. We, we had Richard Goldston. Uh, we had uh, prosecutors like Mark Harmon, who at the end understood the importance of the violence against women. We had Patty Sellers as a special counselor for, this, for these issues. So piece by piece, we were building what later on was drafted at Article 7 and 8 in the Rome Statute as crimes of sexual violence committed against women. Because in November, I'm sorry, in July 1998, in Rome, the Rome Statute was approved, and an international criminal court was finally passed. And it was because of the work done by the ICTY and also by the ICTR, because we, the ad hoc tribunals, demonstrated that it was possible to have an international criminal justice with gender perspective and deliver by international judges with experience, objectiveness, and independence, which is uh, very, very important. Jeez, okay, okay, <laughs> let me finish. <laughs> and let me finish saying this. I am especially proud to have contributed along with my colleagues, especially George Gabriel McDonald, to typify sexual violence against women in armed conflicts and, and international crime. But I want to finish with this. Looking back, it is the ICTY's contribution to international criminal law, humanitarian law, and international human rights law that encourages me to continue working in the world of the international justice. Thank you. Thank you, John. Sorry. Thank you very much, Judge Odio Benito, to, to just remind us all, and, and um, I think so passionately, about just how important and how significant those early days were and, and how the legacy of those early days um, lives on and the impact. I, would anyone else on the panel like to contribute or before? No? No? No comments? Not sure. Um, next, I'll give the floor to Mark Harmon. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be on this panel, and it's an honor to be here and to celebrate the legacy of the ICTY. Before I begin my remarks, I was informed that Judge Odio Bonito would be on this panel, and I am delighted to, to reunite with Judge Odio Bonito because 21 years ago, we appeared in the Rule 61 hearings on Karadich and Mladic. Not, not that I think Rule 61 hearings will be a footnote in the history of the tribunal, but it was always a pleasure to be in front of Judge Odio Benito. This morning, I will discuss the common law practices of plea bargaining, plea agreements, and guilty pleas, and how those notions were incorporated into ICTY practice. I will also discuss the benefits of those practices. 
In his address to the UN General Assembly in November 2004, former ICTY President Ted Marone described the nature of the cases being litigated at the ICTY. His description was thus. The types of cases on the tribunal's docket are necessarily large and complex and our proceedings are necessarily lengthy and costly. Often the crimes charged connected to entire military campaigns occurred over a course of months or years across many locations and involved several defendants. With many counts of indictment, tens or hundreds of witnesses, thousands of pages of documents, most of which must be translated from Serbo-Croat into English and French, the tribunal's working language, those trials are extremely complex. I would like to add to President Marone's observations that the trials at the ICTY were extremely long. Of my four trials, the shortest trial was about 17 months and the longest was about 27 months. I am informed by the press office that the longest trial in ICTY history was the Perlich case, which commenced on April 26, 2006, and concluded on the 2nd of March, 2011. It included 465 trial days. The trial chamber received the evidence of 320 witnesses. Of that total, 208 testified in court and the total number of exhibits introduced by the defense and the prosecution were 9,862. With that in mind, I'm going to turn to the subject of plea bargaining, plea agreements, and guilty pleas. Plea bargaining refers to the practice of resolving criminal charges against a criminal defendant through negotiations between the prosecutor and the defendant and his or her counsel. Plea bargains take two forms, charge bargaining and sentence bargaining. The negotiated settlement is referred to as a plea agreement and it culminates with a guilty plea. In the United States where I'm from, plea agreements and guilty pleas are common practices and are essential components to the US criminal justice system. The plea agreement, the plea bargaining is a judicially sanctioned practice and is regarded with favor as expressed by the US Supreme Court in the case of Blackledge versus Allison, a 1977 case. In that case, the US Supreme Court stated, whatever might be the situation in an ideal world, the fact is that the guilty plea and often the concomitant plea bargain are important components of this country's criminal justice system. Properly administered, they can benefit all concerned. In the United States, approximately 95% of all state and federal criminal cases are resolved through guilty pleas and through plea agreements. The concept of guilty pleas and plea agreements were familiar concepts to the common law lawyers in my office, the Americans, the English, the Australian prosecutors, who comprise a large part of the office of the prosecutor. As a former public defender, I participated in countless plea agreements and guilty pleas, as had my common law colleagues at the OTP. To my civil law colleagues, however, plea agreements and guilty pleas were wa not well known and they were viewed with a great deal of skepticism. Their grave reservations were understandable because of the difference in their legal culture, where full trials were the norm for the most serious crimes and the ID and the ICTY was, in their view, dealing with the most serious crimes. 
Our esteemed first president of the tribunal, Antonio Cassese, in his first annual report to the UN about the work of the ICT stated, quote, plea agreement, plea bargaining finds no place in the rules. A leading academic who followed the tribunal carefully stated that plea bargaining was declared inconsistent with the tribunal's purpose and functions. These views and similar views reflect why guilty pleas and plea agreements were not addressed in the early v versions of the tribunal's procedural rules. Now let me turn to the Erdemovich case. Mr. Erdemovich entered the first guilty pleas of the ICTY and he was also a party to the first written plea agreement. Mr. Erdemovich was a, a Bosnian Croat who served in the Bosnian Serb Army. He was a member of the 10th Sabotage Detachment. In July of 1995, he and members of his unit were ordered by General Mladic to the Branjevo military farm where they participated in a summary execution of approximately 1,200 men and boys. On the same day, Erdemovich refused an order to participate in an additional massacre that took place a few kilometers away at the Pilica Cultural Building. Sometime after the massacre, Mr. Erdemovich was shot and grievously wounded by members of the execution squad. He met with a journalist in Belgrade, as I recall, and described the events that he had witnessed at the Branjevo military farm. Unbeknownst to Mr. Erdemovich, the meeting was being tape recorded by the police. And shortly after it adjourned, both the reporter and Mr. Erdemovich were arrested. Judge Goldstone requested that Mr. Erdemovich be transferred to the ICTY and he was so transferred on the 30th of March 1996. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Erdemovich was indicted for murder charges, both as a crime against humanity and as a violation of the laws and customs of war. I met with Mr. Erdemovich with the UNDU, and it was clear he wanted to cooperate with the ICTY. I therefore made an oral offer to Mr. Erdemovich and to his counsel, the offer being roughly this. Plead guilty to either of the counts on the indictment, cooperate with the prosecutor, and at the time of sentencing, the prosecution would recommend a sentence not to exceed 10 years. After consulting with his counsel, Mr. Erdemovich accepted the offer and he pleaded guilty to a crime against humanity, murder. And the count of murder as a, a violation of the customs of violations of the laws or customs of war was dismissed. He received a 10 year sentence. Now thereafter he appealed his sentence and the appellate chamber remanded the case to the trial chamber for new proceedings holding that his guilty plea had not been informed. His lawyer should have advised him to plead guilty to murder is a violation of the laws or customs of war, a crime which even though the facts were identical was considered to be less serious. In its decision remanding the case back to the trial chamber, the appellate chamber focused in part on how a guilty plea should be dealt with in an international tribunal given the vast differences between the common law and civil law jurisdictions. In finding the concept of a guilty plea per se was consistent with the tribunal's statute and rules of procedure. The 
appeals chamber concluded, quote, the common law institution of the guilty plea should, in our view, find a ready place in an international forum such as the international tribunal confronted by cases which, by their very nature, are very complex and necessarily require lengthy hearings if they are to go to trial under stringent financial constraints arising from allocations made by the United Nations, itself dependent upon contributions of states. Mr. Erdemovich then reappeared in court on the 14th of January, 1998, and he entered a guilty plea to a single charge of murder relating to the same as a violation of the laws of customs of war and it related to the identical content, conduct that served as the factual basis for his former guilty plea. His second guilty plea was entered pursuant to a written plea agreement that was filed on the 8th of January, 1998, it being the first written plea agreement in the tribunal's history. Quite significantly, in its sentencing judgment, the trial chamber recognized the legitimacy of plea agreements in the context of an international tribunal and stated, quote, plea bargain agreements are common in certain jurisdictions in the world. There is not provision for such agreements in the statutes and the rules of procedure and evidence. And uh, th this is the first time such a document has been presented to the International Tribunal. The plea agreement in this case is simply an agreement between the parties reached upon their own initiative without contribution or encouragement of the trial chamber. Upon being questioned by the presiding judge of the trial chamber, the accused confirmed his agreement to an understanding of the matters contained therein. The parties themselves acknowledged that the plea agreement has no binding effect on the chamber, although submissions recommending it were made by both the prosecutor and defense counsel at the hearing on 14 January 1998, in addition to the recommendation in the joint motion. Whilst no way bound by this agreement, the trial chamber has taken it into careful consideration in determining the sentence to be imposed upon the accused. In the second plea, in the plea agreement, the written plea agreement, the recommendation of the prosecutor was that Mr. Erdema served a sentence of seven years and the trial chamber imposed a sentence of five years. Now, significantly, the standards, the safeguards for the acceptance of a guilty plea articulated in the appeals chamber decision were codified in the 1997 amendments to the rules of procedure and evidence, Rule 62 bis, and later the rules of procedure and evidence were amended in 2001 to incorporate a specific rule relating to the plea agreement procedure, that is Rule 62.2. Following, following the uh, adoption of those rules, other tribunals have uh, adopted similar rules. I want to co conclude by <coughs> outlining the benefits of plea bargaining, plea agreements, and guilty plea, which I assert are quite substantial. I will identify five of them. First of all, negotiated settlements and plea agreements often included cooperation agreements, and such agreements yielded important evidence and assisted prosecutors in establishing the truth. Focusing on Erdemovich, Erdemovich identified for us massacre site that was totally unknown to us. There were no survivors from the Pulitzer Cultural Dome. When my investigators went to the Pulitzer Cultural Dome and entered it, it was like a slaughterhouse. 
there were hundreds of people murdered, and but for Air Demovich's cooperation, we would not have known about that. Second, those plea agreements and guilty pleas can serve limited tribunal resources and permitted the tribunal to conclude its work more expeditiously. We had limited resources. We had three courtrooms, a single appeals chamber, I think 16 permanent judges, a limited number of prosecutors, a, a limited number of witness support people. There were 20, in the, in the tribunal's history, there were 20 defendants who disposed of their cases through plea agreements and guilty pleas. Had the judges not been flexible and not adopted the common law practices of accepting plea agreements and guilty pleas, we may not be sitting here today. We may be sitting years later, the time it took to complete 20 trials. Third, guilty pleas uh, and plea agreements significantly mitigated a problem that was common at the ICTY. Because we had no arrest times, we would indict a large number of defendants and they would be arrested seriatim. As a result, we would try these cases over and over and over again. For example, in the central Bosnia cases, Amici, etc., there were five cases related to Amici. In the Srebrenica cases, there were eight trials that involved similar facts. And as a result of that, many of the victims and witnesses were re-traumatized and they did not want to come back to testify. I would submit that guilty pleas in lieu of trials and as well as prudent changes in the rules of procedure and evidence helped ameliorate this serious problem. Fourthly, guilty pleas and the resulting expressions of remorse from guilty persons helped to combat historical revisionism. I attended a long, let me, let me backtrack just a second. Uh, Srebrenica cases established beyond any doubt that those crimes took place. And yet today, there are still people who deny the crimes took place at Srebrenica. Ten years after the massacre, I and Jean-René Ruiz attended a, an outreach program in Srebrenica itself. And in the audience, there was a man who was a Bosnian Serb who was a member of the Serbian, uh, the Bosnian Serb Municipal Assembly, uh, the Ser I'm sorry, the Srebrenica Municipal Assembly. And he said, quote, the massacre is a lie. It is propaganda in order to make a bad picture of the Serbian people. The Muslims are lying. They are manipulating the numbers. They are exaggerating what happened, close quote. So guilty pleas by insiders like Erdemovic, Dragon, uh, Obrenovic, Captain Momir Nikolic, all participants and members of the VRS who publicly announced their participation in those crimes and expressed remorse for them puts the lie to the Shrebenica deniers. Finally, Finally, uh, guilty pleas and acknowledgments of commission of crimes help to establish the truth and promote reconciliation. Uh, Alex Borain, who testified, who was a former co-chair of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, testified before the tribunal about the relationship between acceptance of responsibility and the process of reconciliation. And he said, systems of criminal justice not only determine guilt or innocence, but also contribute to a safe and peaceful society. 
And therefore, those systems are absolutely critical in the process of reconciliation. They are not at odds. They are not a contradiction. In my experience, accepting responsibility for terrible crimes can have a transformative effect and traumatic impact on the perpetrator, but also on the victims of the wider community. Such acceptance, whether by guilty pleas or by criminal cases, in some other form, can, I believe, be a significant factor in promoting reconciliation and creating what I would call space, new space and attitudes and new behavior. It has that potential. So in conclusion, in conclusion, the ICTY established the plea agreements and guilty pleas were acceptable practice in international criminal tribunals and resoundingly demonstrated their value to existing and future tribunals. It is up to those tribunals to heed the lessons of the ICTY. Thank you. Again, thank you very much, Mike. It was fascinating. And so as to um, allow the other panelists um, all the time as well, I'll, I'll pass the floor straight to Colleen. Thank, thank you. you. Colleen. Thank you, John. And thank you very much, the organizers of this event, for asking a member of the defense community to come and participate in it. I am here with a little bit of pressure, I think, because I am only one defense lawyer and that community is comprised of hundreds of people. So I hope that I represent their views here in a fair way. We certainly are um, a varied group of people, lone wolves, like herding cats. There's a number of ways of describing the defense community. Um, but one aspect of that that I'm gonna be focusing on this morning is um, what I consider to be an extremely positive development within the ICTY and for Defense Council in the international criminal community as a whole, which is the development of my favorite organization, and that's the Association of Defense Council practicing before the ICTY, which I'm gonna talk about briefly. Um, and as Judge Ages said actually this morning, I believe that the establishment of that association is one of a series of firsts that the ICTY can definitely take um, credit for and be proud of, and certainly the defense community can. Um, the defense, and this I'm going to give you obviously a different perspective than you've heard so far. The defense lawyers come to these organizations and the ICTY, we come a little later down the road. Everything's been put in place, the rules are there, the structure is there. And at the ICTY in the early days, um, there wasn't really a place for the defense to have a presence within that structure. There were rules, of course, that council had to meet certain qualifications and abide by certain regulations within the context of the tribunal, but there was no place to go. So um, council will come, for example, assigned to a case. You arrive in Holland, it's cold. <laughs> I'm from California, so it took me a while to adjust to that. Uh, you don't speak the language, you don't know where to live, you can't pronounce the names of the streets, although you desperately try with the cab drivers. And then you go to the place where you're to practice law. Uh, you find that there's no office. There is a red tag that you wear around your neck and the tribunal is festooned with signs that say individuals with red passes are not permitted here. Um, there was a defense room, which we all shared, and I was not here in the very beginning of the tribunal, so I hear some of this by folklore, but the uh, lawyers shared one room, no privacy, no ability, of course, to interview anyone there, speak to your team privately, and there was a general sense of an institutional cold shoulder, I think, that defense counsel rightly or wrongly, and I think in the very early days, perhaps rightly, felt that they were experiencing. And unfortunately, you experience this as you go into a situation that's already overwhelmingly challenging. The legal system doesn't reflect anyone's domestic legal system. At the ICTY, of course, there were large um, aspects of the common law system were incorporated there. So for example, the trial process itself, to me, looked very familiar. 
on the other hand, I would be shocked at the evidence that came in, which um, in my domestic practice would never have occurred. So we all had to adjust to a new system. Um, the cases are factually complicated. They're legally complicated. The jurisprudence is brand new. Tadich is relatively new. The cases after that were new. So when you arrive as a defense lawyer, you have to sit down in addition to all the practical issues and learn about that, learn the jurisprudence, learn what happened during the war. I think that I'm keeping up on the news fairly well as a human being in my life and I read all about the war in the newspaper when it was happening and when I got to the ICTY, I realized I didn't know anything. I knew nothing. Um, I was looking at documentaries, reading books, talking to my um, fellow, my colleagues in the defense room to find out what really happened. So it's a very, very challenging experience to begin with and to then feel a lack of institutional support or a lack of presence, I think, was very difficult for people, um, particularly in the early days. On the other side of that, again, I hear this through um, conversations with people, the judges had concerns because there were individuals who came to the tribunal who weren't necessarily completely conversant with um, all the ethical rules and regulations that applied. They may or may not have been well qualified in terms of courtroom skills. So for example, you qualify under the rules as a lawyer, but you may not have the skills to perform that job um, in, a, in a not just adequate way, but um, an uh, a competent way so that your client, your um, the accused is getting a proper and adequate defense. And there were concerns about that. From the defense side, of course, there was a concern of having a more collective voice in this institution. So for example, if you go in as a lawyer, you go to the Office of Legal Aid and Detention, completely fine people, supportive, there's a structure there, but each individual go in there to kind of negotiate for their case from the beginning and the wheel was being reinvented on each case as we went along, what money there would be, um, what other resources might be available so um, it was important for the defense to have a collective voice about that. Also things as basic as changes in the rules of procedure and evidence. These are things that affect your ability potentially when you're in trial and may have a direct effect on the defense function but the defense was excluded from that process. There was no way to have input into that and there were other things that went on. Um, not because people were evil and were trying to prevent the defense from functioning, but because it was a new institution. And some things hadn't been completely thought through yet. Um, the institution is still new. It's only been there for 25 years, about a little less. That's a very new legal institution. So everyone had to learn how to function in this context. And what happened in 2002 at the ICTY, which I consider to be a monument to people listening to each other, paying attention to what happens every day, setting aside their assumptions and their preconceived notions and simply looking at what's going on and working together to make it function better was that the judges and the defense lawyers with the assistance of the registry got together and said, all right, we need an association of defense counsel. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but as an institution there was support for that as well. So some defense lawyers, a Dutch lawyer, someone from the registry got together, they wrote a constitution and created out of whole cloth a new defense organization, and that was the Association of Defense Council. Um, the association is a nonprofit Dutch corporation. It's completely independent from the tribunal. It has uh, a series of committees that I'm gonna talk about briefly just so that you get a sense of what the institution, the, the association does. It was put in place, and what immediately happens from this is that when you come into the institution as a defense lawyer, you're not wandering the hallway looking for where am I supposed to get a robe and where do I put my purse down and where's the courtroom. There's an there's a office there when someone can say to you, this is how this institution functions day to day. These are the people you need to speak to. This is how you get travel authorization or whatever it is that's a practical aspect of your case. There was now a place within the institution for the defense to do that. And of course, that's before you even get to actually putting together a defense and, and the incredible complexity of that. So just the existence of the institution, the association, I think was a huge step forward. 
And there were battles after that because, of course, the defense, the prosecution, the registry, the chambers, we don't all agree on everything all the time. Contrary to popular belief, we don't agree on everything all the time. And so there were conflicts over the years. But in, in for the most part, I think they were very healthy conflicts because, again, we were listening to each other, we were learning from each other, and we were putting together an institution that functioned as efficiently as it could given all the constraints that we've been talking about this morning from different perspectives. Um, what I find interesting about the ADC though, and again, I'm bragging a little about my own favorite organization, is that in addition to what was accomplished within the institution, which I will talk about in a second, over years it actually has reached out beyond the institution. And I'm hoping will continue to have that effect on the legal community as a whole. It's not just there for the lawyers who practice at the ICTY. It's also becoming um, a force within the international criminal law community as a whole. So the way in which this, this has come about, the, the institution has an executive committee, and I'm not gonna bore you with all the details of all of this, but the committees within the institution, everyone's elected to that. This is a democratic institution. Um, the executive committee basically runs the organization from a day-to-day -day standpoint, but when it was important that there be negotiations with the registry or with the Office of Legal Aid and Detention, that particular group was the group of individuals who had authorization to go do that. So within the institution of the ICTY itself, it was clear who was speaking on behalf of the defense and that they were in fact authorized to do that. And for defense counsel, it was clear who was negotiating for them so that there would be some input into that process. Um, there was also a membership committee and this committee would look at all of the applications of people who came in to represent people um, in trials before the ICTY. Now, when the Association of Defense Council was established, and I forgot to mention this, um, there was a rule change to uh, permit that. The judges adopted a rule that said that you may not represent someone at the ICTY unless you are a member of a recognized association of counsel. And thereafter, the registry said and, and agreed the Association of Defense Counsel practicing before the ICTY is that group. Um, I think that was probably a critical, really important, uh, I don't think it, I believe it strongly, very important that that recognition took place because it legitimized the organization and it made clear who had what role to play in what context. In any event, the membership committee within the ADC will review applications for people who wanna represent people in the ICTY courtrooms. And if people didn't qualify, and was thought that there may be difficulties, then they weren't permitted to join the ADC and they didn't get a case. Maybe a year or two later, they would have a sufficient qualification to come back. But the ADC um, performed that function instead of the registry, uh, working with the registry. And so there now you start to see a more symbiotic relationship. The association is also assisting with some of the things that the tribunal itself has to do. There is a training committee, and this goes back to some co uh, comments that were made earlier. Um, the association, the ADC has done a huge amount of training with the lawyers within the group. They've also done training with people in the legal community as a whole. And an example, because I could go on and on about the training, was um, years ago, it was in 2005 or 2006, the ADC held a training for four days that required every lawyer, again, mandatory, every lawyer who had a case at that time had to come to the four-day training and learn things like direct examination, cross-examination, how to draft a motion, how to argue a motion. These were skills that were not necessarily part of every domestic legal system, but boy, were they part of the, the ICTY. I only have 12 minutes already. I mean, two minutes. Um, I'll try to, two, two. yes, I'll try to do this quickly. Um, this was the difference between lawyers going into court and being absolutely devastated by well-trained prosecutors and as a result, failing to represent the accused properly. So it's a very important function. And there have been many trainings since, and I, I won't detail them now because of the, the limits on the time. Um, but they include also people from the outside community. We hold mock trials. We have a lecture series reaching beyond the ICTY itself 
to train people within the community and create a body of qualified individuals who can function in the, in the international criminal courts. We have an amicus committee, and in the uh, years past, the ADC wrote amicus briefs, for example, at IC, in ICTY cases on issues like the extent of JCE liability, uh, defense resources. We have since written amicus briefs for courts within the former Yugoslavia um, about the need to have two counsel in a war crimes case, for example. We've written them for the ICC. So again, the association has branched out. Uh, we have um, an advisory group that can advise lawyers uh, on the requirements of the ethical code so that lawyers don't engage in the um, unethical behavior or make the mistakes. The idea is to train people so that you avoid those mistakes. There are also the ability to provide lawyers with confidential advisory opinions. If they have a problem and they're worried about it, talk to the ADC, you'll get an advisory opinion. And it's a way, again, of avoiding problems. And then finally, although I have a lot of other things to say, I can feel John looking at me. <laughs> um, it's just, it's just that <laughs> intuition one develops over time. Um, I can't close without mentioning that the ADC um, published its own manual of the practice of the defense in the international criminal courts with the assistance of UNICRI and OSCE and other organizations. That defense manual can, is found on the website for the ADC, ICT. And this was a huge success. The manuals written by lawyers who had practiced at the ICTY had very, very practical experience. It's a manual oriented toward practice. This is how you create an argument, structure an argument. This is how you enter a plea bargain. This is how you argue for a reduced sentence. And it's been invaluable, I think, that that manual is there, not only for lawyers at the ICTY, but it's been translated into Serbian, Bosnian, Croatian, Albanian. I'm desperately looking for someone to translate it into French, if there's any volunteers here. Um, it's in the process of being translated into Spanish. So again, it's reaching out into a broader community. We've gotten information back. The manual's been used in Africa. It's been used in South America. These were benefits that none of us in the ADC ever anticipated. But to conclude, I'll say one last thing. Um, you know, the ADC is filled with people who have almost nothing in common. We come from different backgrounds. We have different cultures. We don't speak the same language. People get into political arguments. They have different views of what's going on in the world, and that's the group of lawyers. But somehow we came together and created this, this association. And the way we did it, in my opinion, my modest opinion, is that we kept our eye on the ball. What is it that we share as human beings? What's the goal that we share, and how can we get there together, working together? So I hope that's a legacy from the ADC and from the ICTY as well. We certainly need that kind of view in the world today. And um, it's definitely a positive aspect of my experience there and certainly the other defense counsel there. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Colleen, for showing how well we work together. Yes, thank you. <laughs> we don't even need to speak. Um, <laughs> And I uh, also, um, thanks uh, we, to both Mark and Colleen, I think some fascinating presentations and um, we're all left sitting here just wanting more. Um, but regrettably, we don't have time. And Ma Martin, um, I pass the floor to you and from your perspective, thank you. Thank you, John. I was actually just wondering whether you would say that I will not speak <laughs> since we've <laughs> run out of time. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm particularly happy to talk to you about the registry today and about the legacy of the registry. Uh, back in 2001, I did an internship in the office of the prosecutor. And upon my return to Montreal, I was asked to make a presentation to all the students and the professors at my law school. And I spoke about the structure of the tribunal, the roles of the different organs. And then somebody asked me, would you consider working for the registry? And I remember saying in a split second, absolutely not. <laughs> I felt offended essentially by the suggestion because being a passionate lawyer at the time, I thought everything was happening in the LTP. And to be honest, uh, in a way, this was the way I had felt 
staff or cer certain staff members in the OTP and chambers were looking at the registry. Uh, there was nothing interesting going on in the registry. Having spent 10 years of my life in the registry, I can tell you that that's not true. This is the most exciting place of the whole tribunal. And in fact, uh, I feel extremely, extremely um, honored and happy to uh, associate myself with the registry. And I also know, and I hope some of you do as well, that this is the engine room of the tribunal. This is where all the dots are being connected, all the support services come together to make the trials possible. So we heard a lot about the legal legacy of the tribunal and um, as Kerstin put it very rightly, the ICTY brought the law out of the books, I noted it down. Uh, the ICTY's registry legacy is somewhat different. I think it's in the institutional design and the development and the implementation of the so-called quasi-judicial functions, I would say, which make the, tribune, the, the functions possible. Of course, it's very easy to say this now, 20 years uh, later, 25 almost years later, uh, but uh, of course, imagine we're back in 93. A tribunal has just been created by the Security Council. It exists on paper. It's meant to apply its own law. It doesn't form part of any uh, national legal system. Um, it sits some 2,000 kilometers away from uh, the scene of the crimes, from where the potential accused and victims are. Uh, and uh, also the suspects, obviously, it has no infrastructure, no rules, no policies. This is where we are in 93. I would argue it's relatively, it must have been relatively clear what the judges were meant to do and the prosecutors were meant to do at that time. But how about the registry? The statute said the registry is responsible for the administration and the servicing of the tribunal. What did that mean? <laughs> now think about it, honestly. It, now we know what it means, but back then, what did it mean? So obviously it included some very basic things in the beginning, finding the, an appropriate building, um, you know, uh, purchasing all the equipment and computers and uh, furniture, if you will, arranging for the security of the building, recruiting staff to start with for all three organs, because at the time, obviously, there were 11 judges and maybe a, a, a small uh, planning team. But, and this is maybe the place to pay tribute to all these hugely, extremely dedicated staff that the, the tribunal has always had. Uh, who form part of, of, of its legacy today, because many of them have moved on to other tribunals and brought this institutional knowledge and experience with them as well. Building a courtroom. I mean, there were, I'm sure, the high-tech uh, concepts back then, but there was nothing in practice. So the ICTY was the first ever court to, to do it, uh, to, to, to employ technology in the building of the courtroom, the, the ability to zoom in on the witnesses, to produce uh, live transcripts, the, the technological protection of witnesses through face and voice distortion, um, e-court, obviously, which was de de um, developed later on, uh, life interpretation facilities, uh, and so on and so forth establishing the relationships with the host state. Um, obviously, this is something that national courts don't do, but an international court had to do. So we are seated here in the Netherlands. This, these are the operational issues. The, the John was talking about the bringing in and out of the courtroom of the, of the accused on a daily basis, but also the privileges and immunities of the organization. So all of that was done only to establish the tribunal physically. And I must say, from having seen a few other tribunals, the tribunals and courts which have been created subsequently have followed essentially the very same steps. So they have had something to learn from. They may have as well used some of the mistakes made by the ICTY, but anyway, they were able to benefit from that experience. But the real pioneer work of the registry, in my view, is in the myriad of um, support functions which in a national legal system are typically performed by various state agencies. The ICTY obviously was an international tribunal, so there was no state to take care of such functions. And the registry had to design itself, to structure itself in such a way to, to, to you know, create policies, rules, uh, working methods to be able to cater for those functions. And I look at uh, Mr. Hans Holzhaus, who is in the room today, I'm pretty sure uh, as the second register of the tribunal, you must have been very busy with these very things. So 
uh, fantastic work as well. Um, so just a few examples, because there are so many, and I, I decided to select just a few which uh, are probably the, the, the more uh, interesting ones. Have you ever thought that every single accused who appeared before the tribunal had to be arrested and transferred to the tribunal and then detained at the tribunal? So this is a huge logistical operation, which of course involves the Dutch authorities, but it also involves a number of procedures which the ICTY uh, undertakes internally. The ICTY had to create a detention unit, which is state-of-the-art detention unit, as most of you probably know by now, developed its own uh, rules of detention, which is under the supervision of the, I mean, they're administered by the registrar under the supervision of the, of the president. The status of the detainees, of course, had to be taken into account because they're presumed innocent pending their trial. Uh, and uh, uh, we also arranged for a monitoring by the ICRC because we wanted to be sure that we are meeting those very high standards of detention. Uh, all of these things have now been taken over by the other courts and tribunals. In fact, those who are in the Hague and those courts and tribunals seated in The Hague are using the same detention facility and using the same procedures. Has it occurred to you that most of those 5,000 witnesses who have gone through the courtrooms of the, um, of the ICTY had to travel to the Netherlands? Mm -hmm. They had to be brought to the Netherlands from somewhere. And in the case of uh, those coming from the former Yugoslavia, this has meant that um, usually an ICTY staff member had to accompany them and travel with them. The whole process of making this possible from the moment of you know, picking up this person from a remote village somewhere, bringing them to the courtroom, making sure that they are in court on time, that their uh, uh, needs are being catered for, uh, they receive appropriate psychological and other support. All of that has been the job of the registry. And I'm not sure how many of you realize that, but it is a super important function because without witnesses, obviously, we have no trials. Um, in this connection, of course, there is a witness protection program which the tribunal has developed, the registry has led the way. Uh, translation and interpretation, that's an exception in national proceedings, right? In most cases, if, if you have an international uh, 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 witness, that one person may need translational interpretation. But in the case of the ICTY, this is actually the norm. The proceedings takes, take place uh, in at least three languages simultaneously. So the tribunal had to develop, the registrant, we had to develop those uh, practices, policies, over time, uh, um, as most of you would know, uh, uh, um, a blend of three languages was created as BCS from Bosnian, Croatian and Serbian, which is now commonly used as I think as an acronym for uh, that language. Uh, but also the very language used in court is super important. I mean, it means guilt or uh, innocence in the case uh, of the accused. So the quality of that um, translation and interpretation services is also in the hands of the registry. Um, defense issues, of course, we've heard from Colleen about the establishment of the ADC, and again, this is something that we feel extremely uh, proud uh, of, but think about it this way. In the national context, there is a bar association usually, and the lawyers are members of the bar, they qualify through that bar. There is no such thing at the international level. So somebody had to verify the credentials of these uh, lawyers coming from all over the world and say, yes, you, you are in able to practice before the tribunal based on the rules. The registry assumed that responsibility uh, uh, at the time. And uh, we also developed the legal aid policies, which are now commonly, I think, accepted as best practice in this field. Uh, we developed policies for determining somebody's indigence, for example. Are they entitled to legal aid in the first place uh, or not? Um, closely related to that, as soon as it became modern for certain accused to represent themselves, the registry had to react fast and develop a system, a mechanism that supports those self-representing defendants. So that's how the Pro Se office was created. It's an office that liaises between the accused, self-representing accused, and the other organs of the tribunal and essentially assists them in the preparation and presentation of their defense. Uh, I'll skip a few <laughs> because I'm also feeling John's... Uh, <laughs> And I know him. Uh, I'm doing well. Cool. 
I'd, I'd like to say a few words about outreach as well, because um, um, typically courts don't speak other than through their judgments, and I'm afraid we've heard that several times from a number of our judges. Um, the reality is, though, that for a court like this, sitting 2,000 kilometers away, delivering judgments in a language the population doesn't understand, uh, which are hundreds of pages long and you know, rendered at the end of proceedings which have lasted years, without an active outreach program, without making sure that the, the people on the ground for whom, at the end of the day, did these courts work, um, know what's going on, understand the work of the tribunal, uh, the tribunal is simply not reaching those people. And in 2000, uh, then President MacDonald launched the ICTY outreach program, and since then it's been run by the registry. And I think um, it, it was able to um, undo, if you will, some of the damage that had been done in the early years, not completely, of course, and that's probably one of the weaknesses of the tribunal altogether. But interestingly enough, even though outreach has never been part of the core mandate of the ICTY, it is now considered part of the core mandate of other courts and tribunals. And to me, that is huge legacy of the ICTY to the other international courts and tribunals. And maybe the last point I wanted to make was about the administration. Uh, again, this is, uh, one would say, what the registry should normally do, so what's the big deal? Yes, it is true. It's business as usual for the registry, administering the court, making sure that there is money in the budget, defending the budget, making sure that there are enough staff members, for example, in the three organs and so on. But it's something that I would like us to think about a little bit, because you would all know the UN is a rather rigid bureaucracy, so it has very strict rules on pretty much everything. The ICTY registry had to um, blend those very rigid rules with the requirements of a court of law, which very often require confidentiality, for example. You're not able to disclose a certain mission that the OTP does somewhere because you don't want your informants to be identified and so on. So uh, over the years, the ICTY registry has uh, um, uh, perhaps walked on thin ice to achieve those uh, results, but at the end of the day, the tribunal has been largely uh, successful, I think, because of the great support that we've been receiving from our administration. So I'm concluding. Um, clearly, for the international courts and tribunals, the um, precedent of the ICTY registry has been either a model that they followed or at least an inspiration. And I would also say, um, based on the experience of the ICTY, some of the new courts and tribunals have really been able to rectify some of the weaknesses of the ICTY. And uh, that's great, because they've had that opportunity which the ICTY didn't have. Um, I also think the um, experience of the, of the ICTY registry is um, useful for domestic proceedings and also some of the hybrid courts and tribunals that have been created since then. Uh, in terms of witness protection, um, the, you know, the model for operational um, and technological uh, aspects of national trials, such as witness protection, for example, the, the various courtroom facilities, and so on and so forth. And, uh, well, video links I forgot to mention, but obviously we, we, we have been able, Mark spoke about that earlier, we were able to uh, hear so many witnesses through video conferencing, and this is something that uh, is now accepted as common practice in all the courts, but it was not the case in the beginning, so um, uh, another area of, of legacy. And uh, perhaps one last sentence. It strikes me that Srebrenica took place while the ICTY was already in, in existence, at least. So it didn't have that um, preventive effect, that the, the existence of the ICTY itself didn't have that preventive effect, obviously. Um, and from what I know and what I've read, I think back then, at that time, nobody truly believed that the tribunal would actually work in 94, 95. It was not clear which way it would go. What we know now, is that had it failed, I don't think we would have seen any or at least some of the, 
subsequently created courts and tribunals. Certainly not the ICC, I don't think. As, as you said, Judge, the experience of the ICTY and the ICTR showed that this international justice can actually work. And uh, I feel particularly proud and super happy to have been part of the ICTY. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> thank you to all four of the panelists. I, I have just um, found it most fascinating. D we have a few minutes. I, if I'd like to hear some questions. Um, well, we've we've got one up here. Maybe I'll take two or three questions. And um, so it's the first hand. Good Good morning, I'm Dov Jacobs from Leiden University and also defense at the ICC. Um, I'd have a lot of comments on the different panels, but I'll actually just ask a question because looking forward and looking back requires some level of honesty. And to pick up on Martin's point about identifying the problems with ICTY and correcting them, could each one of you um, name one thing in their own experience, in their own practice as judge, defense, prosecutor, which you think was a good thing that it's not being taken over by other tribunals. You know, so in terms of legacy, as you said, Martin, that's also learned from mistakes. So is there one practice which you think was necessary at the ICTY given its youth and which is a good thing that it's not taken over by other tribunals? Thank you. Judge Audio Benito, I have a very simple and easy question for you. Will there ever be a possibility of new international criminal tribunals over Libya, Afghanistan, Iraq? And will there be, uh, be any possibility to have uh, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, uh, Tony Blair, and Bush transported from uh, London and from Washington into the Scheveningen uh, prison cells. Thank you very much. Uh, my Thank name is Nela Schrumpf and I've been, uh, I used to work at the ICTY and now my um, work is mostly academic work and I just finished an article in Search for Truth at Mass Prosecutor's Trials, Will Judges and Lawyers Have the Last Word? And uh, you can suspect what my answer is, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, so my question is in, the, um, in, in a connection with my academic research to Mark Harmon, as much as I appreciate uh, all the uh, legal arguments for guilty pleas, uh, there are a few examples where, and I would like you to consider, maybe you already thought about it, where guilty pleas actually do not work, not to bring justice, but neither to bring the more truth about what happened. And here I have three examples from the uh, ICTY practice. One obviously is, is Erdemovic, which is immensely important case, but it is something quite curious about him being a first indictee for Srebrenica and being a Croat, which uh, uh, I think is absolutely possible and factually true. But the fact that in the guilty plea, you can have, uh, you actually can miss very important linkage to the joint crim criminal enterprise and to higher command structure if you have someone at Erdemovic case that just uh, agrees to everything that happened and then uh, the linkage to joint criminal enterprise is absent. And two other interesting cases that might more obscure truth and obscure justice in a way is a guilty plea of Biljana Plavšić. Because there is some idea that guilty plea uh, automatically means contrition. Guilty plea is a technical legal thing. You can argue for guilty plea without really ever thinking you're, that you are guilty. And in the case of Biljana Plavšić, it was a very easy way for her 
to minimize and her role in the war and not to appear as a witness in any other case and probably to believe still that she was not guilty. And then the other case that uh, guilty plea did not bring justice to m full justice and full truth was the guilty plea of um, a Milan Babic who did show contrition, who was used by prosecution not just in one case but in many cases and eventually could not stand the pressure he was and indicted and sentenced by ICTY and then asked to be witnessed in multiple cases and in the same time home in Serbia and among Serbs he was treated as a traitor. So Milan Babic actually did everything uh, our modern views of guilty plea showed but he ended tragically because apparently there was no way like someone who showed contrition to go further from that point of view. And then if we compare it with what Milan Babic did and what was the justice achieved by him by the tribunal and you compare it with someone like General Momčilo Perišić who was involved very heavily in Bosnian war and who was acquitted, uh, never guilty, uh, never, never pleaded guilty. So as much as I do agree with most of the things we said, there should be some question marks how guilty pleas eventually work and when justice is concerned and what their impact on the truth about conflict is. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'll just squeeze in one last question because I know Kate was, yep. oh, just, yep. just one last question here and then I'll give the floor. Thank you. Yeah, my question is to, uh, so Kate McIntosh, I'm the Deputy Registrar of the ICTY. And my question is to Colleen. Um, how would you assess, Colleen, moving forward, the function of the ABC ICTY with perhaps what the International Criminal Court has established with the Office of the Public Counsel for Defence? We have four very interesting questions. Um, and the first question was for all four panellists, but perhaps we'll just... Um, I'll just ask each of the panelists to speak and respond to, to all four questions as, as they feel is appropriate. Well, I, I, I feel um, competent to answer only the first one <laughs> uh, about the mistakes the ICTY has made. And obviously, since I've left the tribunal, I speak in my own opinion here, in my uh, own name. I think, uh, and I've always thought that, um, Self-representation does not work in international trials. So if I think that, uh, if, if there is something that future or newly created courts may want to consider is whether the right to represent oneself is so um, fundamental and always unrestricted as we have sometimes applied it at the ICTY. Obviously I'm not judge and I'm not speaking in, in such capacity but that's my opinion. Thank you. I, I would say in retrospect the indictments were too big in many cases and they consumed vast amounts of limited resources from the ICTY. I think the, an approach in retrospect should have been to try to narrow some of these indictments down. That's my comment. Thank you. Um, I understood the question as what was a, a beneficial thing at the ICTY that has not been adopted at another court? Was that the question? It was the other way around. <laughs> well, what was not beneficial that has occurred at another court? I think that the defense comes to this, con this kind of question in a very different context because the defense, as far as I can see, um, based on experiences to date at the ICC, for example, uh, is still struggling to get its feet on the ground to get respect, recognition, and understanding of the defense function, proper funding. Um, those battles seem to be, or conflicts, whatever we want to call them, seem to be cycles that we go through again and again and again. So my view of the question is there's experience that occurred at the ICTY that has been very positive. We've learned from some mistakes and hopefully other defense groups in other contexts 
will look very carefully at that and see what can be adopted given their particular situation and what maybe is not a great idea. I'm sorry to be real general, but the defense is still a relatively amorphous uh, entity. There's, there, with the exception of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, which I don't want to spend time on um, because it's so different, it's still a, a, a institution that's gaining recognition and credibility, at least in my opinion. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, Jody or Benita, who would like to respond to on the, the, the f from the first question. Yeah. Yes, or, or the, the, the question about the different tribunals. Yes, on the di yes. Thank you. I, I would say that there is a short answer to your question. If we have political will we will have international criminal justice in one permanent court like the ICC or perhaps in other tribunals, ad hoc tribunals. It could be because you have two options. Uh, one, for me the best, is for uh, um, everyone, every country, be part of the Rome Statute and of course, submit to the jurisdiction of the court all the problems, all the crimes committed in, in armed conflicts. And that would mean that countries like India, like Pakistan, like United States, like Russia, like China, like Israel should be part of the Rome Statute. That would permit to have these trials in, in the ICC uh, stance. The other possibility um, could be to trigger the mechanism of the Article 13, William Shabbat 13, the trigger mechanisms of the Rome Statute 13. Uh, is the 13 or the 15? No, 13. Okay. That means that the Security Council can send a situation to the consideration of the uh, ICC, as they did in, uh, in Libya or they did in, in Darfur. But the lack of political will in these cases is that they don't give a penny to the ICC to uh, continue with investigations and so on and so forth. So you see the the, the investigators and, and all the prosecutors, they can't work without money. And so the ICC have the cases, but they don't have the money. So if you are going to bring here Tony Blair, which would be possible, please accompany that with some certain budget. So, but it's possible, but it's lack of political will. All we need around the world is the political will to stop the impunity from the beginning. Thank you very much, Judge. We're actually 15 minutes over time, so I think for the, for the yes, okay, we have a very, please, go ahead. Sorry, I had to intercede because there was one question about the ADC, which I think is really important. The, um, the, Defense Council at the International Criminal Court last year uh, formulated their own new Association of Defense Council, the International Criminal Court Bar Association, ICCBA. Their constitution is very much based on the ADC constitution. They're a new organization. They have a huge number of lawyers on the list of counsel, and I don't know what their um, membership is yet, but it's an organization that's still in the process of growing. They are not mandatory. It's not mandatory that you belong to it. It's not mandatory that you're a member in order to have a case there. So that part is yet to be seen. Much about that organization has yet to be seen. And Kareem Khan is here. He's president, and he will be on this afternoon's panel. Um, separate from that, the ADC is now the Association of Counsel for the Residual Mechanism, the MICT. And as I mentioned earlier, we're doing training in the community, and what's happened is that 
there are lawyers who work at other international courts, not the ICC, who have actually approached the ADC and said we could use your assistance, for example, on ethical issues that are arising in, in the context where we work. Um, we could use some training because we're not getting it in training in a particular area. So the ADC, unlike the ICTY, is not going to shut down. Um, we're hoping to expand and include also younger lawyers um, to create a separate institution, We are a continuing institution. We've been around for 15 years, and we have that much experience in an international criminal court. No other international association of counsel has that. So we have really invaluable experience to give to people with amicus briefs, with training, with all the things that I've already mentioned. So there's a real push now within the ADC to make sure that we don't lose that momentum and however it is that we are able to continue within the international um, community that we do that. So maybe Mark, you could quickly respond to the question and then I think uh, Ferdi or Benito will ask after will respond as well. to the plea agreement question? Yeah, okay. I'm happy to respond to that. First of all, a, a prosecutor in assessing a defendant has the problem of determining whether or not remorse is genuinely felt or is situational. In other words, is the person who is pleading guilty and wants to make a plea agreement gaming the system and there are examples I think in anybody's practice or everybody's practice where we where I per particularly had a belief that remorse was not genuine that and I had other cases where remorse I thought was genuinely felt and Ademovich being one uh, Plopsic being the opposite. Plopsic was not a, a successful plea agreement, but plea agreements are not perfect, and they're not going to be perfect. They're a way to, they are a way to uh, resolve cases, uh, uh, determine the truth, get valuable evidence if possible, and promote reconciliation. That's what I, I say about plea agreements. I, I don't defend them wholeheartedly in the sense that I think they've meted out perfect justice. They haven't. And they never will. So uh, I, I think er, in Erdemovich's case, you mentioned the plea, Mr. Erdemovich was missing linkage evidence. Mr. Erdemovich was a either a private or a corporal in the army. He was not a high-ranking man and therefore he wasn't in a position to finger, you know, high-ranking officers. He, I think, truthfully gave us the evidence that he had in his knowledge and he was very helpful. He testified in multiple cases uh, his evidence was deemed to be credible and relevant in many cases. So uh, I, I can't say more about plea agreements to, to uh, I, I, I have no further comments on plea agreements, thanks. Thank you very much, Mark, and I'm, as we're <coughs> Well into coffee time, I'm just going to give the final word to Judge Odia Benito and uh, then say thank you to everybody. Thank you, Yun. You wanted to ask me something about uh, my thought about the ICC first uh, decision on victims' rights. I think this is a very, very, very important question. but. First of all, I would like to say that so many important things have been said this morning, and so many important things could be said as well. So I have a proposal for President Meron. Perhaps he could set up a task force 
to write a book about the first 21st years of the ICTY experience. I think this is a very, very rich experience for the international criminal justice and for the victims of these armed conflicts as well, with the failures and, and also with the, the, the positive aspects. Uh, listening to Od Martin uh, about 1995 and what happened in Srebrenica, I remember that when we knew in the ICTY about the genocide, some of us were so sad, so depressed, that we were thinking in, in, in resigning. Because what we're doing there to the third to prevent these, these horrors. But we also thought that it would be worse without the ICTY. And I remember that when the Dayton Agreement were in process, Milosevic was there and he wanted as a, a precondition of the, of, the, of the peace talks to close the ICTY. In 19, 1995. And there was a very, very strong position, very strong political will of a very special woman called Madeleine Albright saying, no way, the ICTY has to continue because its mandate has to be accomplished. Now, 25 years later of the first years, we know that she was fully right. And the, all this legacy has been crucial for all the international criminal uh, justice and for the International Criminal Court. One, one issue I, I, I can't avoid to mention to you is about the victims. Because in the, in the ICTY statute and the rule in the first rules of procedure and evidence, victims' rights didn't exist. Victims uh, didn't have any participation in the process, only as witnesses. Only as witnesses, we listen to them talking about their pains and suffering and losses and what happened to them and to their families. But they didn't get any reparations. They didn't get any uh, support. Later on, George MacDonald established the, this very important outreach program, which was the first one that then was included in the ICC Rome Statute. And all the victims' participation in the, in the, in the Rome Statute procedures, are thanks to this, it was very, very important to include in the Rome Statute the victims' rights to participate with the views and concerns in the proceedings. And it's also very important, all the reparations included in the statute and in the rules of procedure and evidence of the, of the ICC. But as uh, with the plea bargaining, but not, not, not everything is, is, is perfect. From the point of view of the victims' rights and sexual violence crimes, in my opinion, the ICC has so far proved to be a poor and disappointing experience. For that reason, I think that we have to back our, and looking back to our experience in the ICTY and how with that statute with only the, the, the rules of, of procedure and evidence we drafted at the beginning and, and then the, the, the 
modification that, come, that, that came. We, in the ICTY, were able to build what the ICTY built. Because that means that the judges, the prosecutors, the registrars, working all together, built this legacy. And we are really proud, we, the ICC, ICTY people, are very proud of, of this morning, of this legacy. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. It's time for coffee. <laughs>